So you should consider this a leak. This is not something that we're ready to make a formal announcement about because we're still working out the details, but I wanted to get word out to some people who might be interested and want to think this over because if this opportunity is going to be a good fit for you, I want you to understand it in some detail so that you don't make a decision based on too little information. Yesterday, I had lunch with Northwest Christian University's president, Joe Womack, and what he said was he thought it would be good for the school if we were to give away scholarships to people who had done forensics in the homeschooling leagues. He judged around at the West Coast Championship, and he was really, really very impressed with the students he saw walking around campus, with the students he saw competing, with the parents he talked to, and he said that we really need to get some of those students here to NCU which is what I've been telling him for several years. So the scholarships that he's talking about, he's saying up to six of them, and fairly hefty partial tuition scholarships, the same amount that athletes on several of our teams get. And I was looking over the financial aid, and if you look between the merit scholarships and the ethical leadership scholarships, and any of you who may be the children of clergy, you could really whittle down the cost of going to school here to where it really would not be very much. So. I would encourage you, if that sounds at all interesting to you, to have a look at our academic programs and then fairly soon when I'm able to make an announcement about the scholarships, if it looks like this is a good fit, then maybe you want to come pay us a campus visit and we will see what comes of it. Now I do need to tell you what the assumptions are under which you would get a forensic scholarship because it's not quite the same as what would be expected of you if you got a forensic scholarship from another university. There are three big ideas that I'm going to have to talk to you about, and this is going to take a little while, so I hope you're comfortable, because there are three premises that I have to lay out, and then I'll talk about how being a scholarship forensic student at NCU is very different. And for a lot of you, it is not going to be a good fit, and to you, I would say, God bless you, we're all building the same kingdom, go with our blessing, we'll see you out there on the circuit, we'll try to take you down, but no hard feelings about any of that but some of you, I think, will see in what I'm proposing something that is a good fit for you. So, here we go with the three premises. Premise number one, a very good friend of mine named Michael Hester is the director of debate at the State University of West Georgia in Carrollton, Georgia. And teams he's coached, you know, that's not exactly Harvard or Dartmouth or Emory, but he's coached, the teams he's coached have won CETA Nationals, I forget how many times. He is an absolutely brilliant debate educator, and he and I were graduate students at the University of Georgia at the same time years and years ago, and something he said has never left me. He said, from the time you first hear about debate until you first make it to the ELIM rounds in the open division at a good-sized tournament, through that time, you get about 85% of all the benefit you will ever get out of debate. Everything after that, after you clear at your first tournament, is the last 15%. Now I'm going to take that idea and I'm going to run with it a little bit because in my years of coaching what I have seen is there are some people who go about trying to extract that last 15% in a very wise and very healthy way and then there are the rest. And the rest, I have to say, are the bigger segment and they let their lives get out of balance and they miss out on other opportunities because you get really into very, very diminishing returns. You have to escalate your commitment so very much to continue to be competitive, to go deep into tournaments, to be winning consistently, and there are a lot of things that you have to give up if you want to keep up with the competition. I did a study a few years ago, which I presented at the National Communication Association, where I polled debaters who had gone on to be college professors. And one of my questions was, what were the downsides? In what ways did debate impede your academic development? And many of them said that they were unable to take foreign language classes because, because those, those usually met more times during the week and they couldn't reconcile that with tournament travel. They were unable to take very challenging, very rigorous methods classes or lab sciences, and they had to put those off, or they had to just completely skip them altogether. They couldn't study abroad in many instances because they didn't feel with their career development that they could take part or all of an entire season and not be in the country to travel with the team. So that last 15%, you have to be very wise because the siren call of it can really lead you to miss out on other opportunities that are equally as valuable and do just as much to hone you and make you useful to God. So premise number one, 
if you've got good enough that you're making the elimination rounds at decent sized tournaments, you have already had most of the benefit that forensics is ever going to have for you. I'm a believer in continuing to pursue excellence. This is not meant as a criticism of programs that every year go out and try to win nationals. There's a need for them and there's a place for them, but keep that premise in mind. Premise number two, it is incumbent upon us when God blesses us richly to let those blessings overflow and flow out to other people. We have a contest here at Northwest Christian University called the Bash Whistler Bible Reading Contest. We've had it for 50 years, since the early 1960s. And we have one student, he's actually on the forensics team, and he's actually a homeschooled student. His name is Peter. And he, when he was a freshman, came in second place in the Bash Whistler. And then as a sophomore, he won. And the, the next fall, we had a new professor of Christian ministry who heard about all of this and pulled Peter aside and said, it's time for you to have disciples. God obviously has given you a very powerful gifting, and you've demonstrated that gift, and you've displayed that gift, and you've been a very good role model to your fellow students here at the school, but you should take someone on, and you should build them up and see how far they can go. Well, Peter did. He picked a protege, but he entered the contest again himself, and it's, it's very funny, I think, because he won again last year as a junior for the second straight time, but the person who came in second and almost beat him. The, there were three judges in the finals, and Peter got a 1-1-2, one, one, and two, and Skyler got a 1-2-2, two, and two, and Skyler was the one that Peter had worked with. And I have to say, I was not judging the finals, but I would have voted for Skyler too. So... The second premise I have here is the people that God has gifted, it is incumbent upon us not only to clutch those gifts to ourselves, but also to give back. And it's really important that we take the gifting and we bless other people. The third and final big idea or premise that I need to talk about is Northwest Christian University has a tradition going all the way back to its founding that the teaching of speaking skills, of oral communication skills, it's in our DNA. The school was founded in 1895 as a Bible college, and back then you can only major in Bible, Bible, or Bible. But the second program that they opened up just four years later in 1899 was the School of Homiletics, and it was headed up by the school's co-founder, a man named David Kellams. And so one of my little unofficial mottos for the, for the communication major, of which I'm the advisor, is that we are in our third century of excellence. And as a matter of fact, the modern communication field, a lot of people trace the founding of it back to the mid-1920s, and an article by a scholar by the name of Herbert, Herbert Witchhounds on the, literal, on the literary criticism of oratory. And I like to tell people, we were cutting edge. We had a communication department a full quarter century before that article hit print, and a lot of other colleges across the country started forming departments of communication and splitting them out of their English department. That's something that we've been a bit of a leader in. Two years ago, one of our trustees, a man by the name of Frank Morse, who's a state senator and a very wealthy man, he's in uh, Coca-Cola bottling, no, wait a minute, I'm getting our trustees mixed up. But at any rate, Frank Morse, who's one of our trustees and also an alumnus of the school and a very successful operator of business, he came to a trustee meeting and just in some of the comments as the meeting was breaking up, he told everybody that throughout his time since leaving uh, Northwest Christian, he said you could always tell that someone had graduated from Northwest Christian whenever they stood up and began to speak. For most of the history, not for most of, but for quite a bit of the history of the school, for I think over 20 years, the communication professor was a man named Lee Lane. Lee Lane is still around. I had breakfast with him a month or two ago. He's retired now, and I'm still trying to step into his shoes and fill them, which is a, a huge task. But people who went to school during his time here just speak of him with reverence. And it was known from one end of the campus to the other that that was what set us apart. We are the ones who speak. We speak boldly. We speak powerfully. We've been given a word of truth and we take it out into the world and we spread it by not hanging back, by not being reticent or sloppy or unprepared. We spend our time in college polishing our eloquence 
and we take that ability out and we make the world different and we try to make it better. We take the truth to a world that is desperately hungry for it. And what I want, what I want my legacy at Northwest Christian to be is I want that to completely permeate the student body. And that is the third premise. That's big idea number three. So with those three premises, let me explain to you what will happen if you were to apply to the school and if you were to get one of the forensic scholarships. You would be expected to put in roughly half the number of clock hours that an athlete is expected to put in. An athlete over the course of a semester puts in about three hours of practice a day. You would be expected to put in 150 clock hours tentatively. We may adjust these details, but over a 15 week semester, that's 10 hours a week, which is about an hour and a half a day. Now, we, that would be by the end of the semester, not each week, and there would be provisions in that understanding, in that agreement, it would all be in writing, that traveling to a tournament would be a block of hours. Tentatively, I'm saying that would be, every tournament you went to would be about 20 hours, and that taking classes that were public speaking classes, intro public speaking, advanced public speaking, speech writing, the forensics class, or the professional presentations class, all of those would count toward the clock hours that you owed for your scholarship because with you in the class it would raise the standard and give your classmates a role model that they could follow but the rest of your clock hours you need to put in doing prep work and doing practice during the week so possibly working on the extent files researching for a platform spending time rehearsing one of your other events coming and doing one-on-one -on -one work with me but here's the thing about the Northwest Christian University forensics team we do not travel very widely. We go to about two tournaments each semester, and they're all in Oregon. What this enables you to do, first of all, is to have balance in your life, to do other things. You can work on the school paper. You can be on the, the street drama team. You can be a member of any one of a number of other campus organizations. From time to time, one of the students decides to round everybody up and stage a play. You could be in the school play. All of those are opportunities. I've had at least one forensics team member who was a scholarship athlete. He was on the cross country team and he qualified for nationals in cross country. And I have at least one student I'm talking to right now who's a basketball player who wants to give forensics a try. There are not that many colleges in the world where you can do multiple things like that and still be a scholarship forensics team member. But to me, it's important because that last 15% of the benefit that you can get from forensics should not grow to where it crowds out everything else in your life. The second thing that you should know about NCU forensics and what I have in mind for this scholarship is two years into college, at the end of your second year, at the end of your sophomore year, your second full season of competition in forensics, we would throw you a big old party because it would be your retirement. For two seasons, you would compete and the standard out in front of you would not be a national championship because on four tournaments a year you're never going to get there and as a matter of fact we really don't have any ambition of going to nationals if we had people qualify a lot of events and we had money in the budget we might revisit that decision we're far more likely to go to NCCFI than we are to go to AFA or NFA but that's really not our objective our objective is excellence based on everything we know based on all the potential you have based on the strength of your material and the strength of your gift just excellence. And along the way, we would take the feedback that you get at tournaments and use that to hone you to try to get you closer and closer to excellence. And then after two full seasons of doing it in college and all the lessons you can learn from taking it beyond the level at which you competed in the homeschool league into the college realm, after two full seasons of that, it would be time for you to be done as a competitor. And then the fun really begins because then you become a peer coach. Your challenge is to reach out to the other students at NCU to encourage as many as possible to give forensics a try, to work with them, to be an extra pair of eyes and an extra pair of hands that they can go to, that they can work up their events to where as many students as possible go to at least one tournament, try at least one season of forensics. What I would love to see happen out of all this would be for the blessings God has given you to overflow and you get to bless other people and you get to feel the real excitement that comes from knowing you made a difference in someone else's life, that you took a novice, a beginner, who probably wouldn't even have considered giving it a try, and you made it seem safe. You made it seem thinkable. I do my best, but I'm a lot older than my students. 
you on the other hand are their peer. And if you tell them what kind of difference it's made in your life and if you invite them to come along to some of the closer tournaments and see you compete and you work on them and you work on the newly arriving freshmen and tell them that it's fun and tell them that it's wonderful to have friends at other schools and lure them in and build them up then you get the kind of sense of deep satisfaction and accomplishment that you made a difference to other people. And if this grows, takes root and grow, what I would love to see after a few years of it is that everybody at NCU just takes it for granted. That to be an NCU student, to be a beacon, you need to be a speaking beacon. That's our nickname for our forensics team. We are the speaking beacons. And I would like for it to, come, to become the nickname of more than just the forensics team for it to be something that everyone who's a student at NCU just presumes that they're going to need to take care of in their time here, that they are going to build up their speaking skills. And what Senator Morse said about NCU will become true once again, that you can tell an NCU student, an NCU graduate, from the graduate of any other college in Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, quite possibly in the country, when you hear them get to their feet and begin to speak. So. That's my vision for the scholarship. Right now, everything I'm saying is unofficial, informal, because we are still hammering out the details. But if this sounds like the kind of thing that'd be a good fit for you, then I hope you'll pray about it and give us some thought, and that maybe once we have these details finalized and we make an announcement, that you'll be in touch.